Hello everybody. Let's talk about stress and strain in metals. So let's begin. So before starting that one, let's discuss about elastic and plastic deformation. Actually, when a piece of metal is subjected to a uniaxial tensile force, deformation of the metal occurs. If the metal returns to its original dimensions and the force is removed, the metal is said to have undergone elastic deformation. The amount of plastic deformation a metal can undergo is small since during elastic deformation the metal atoms are displaced from their original positions. Thus when the force on a metal that has been elastically deformed is removed, the metal atoms return to their original positions and the metal takes back its original shape. If the metal is deformed to such an extent that it cannot fully recover its original dimensions, it is said to have undergone plastic deformation. During plastic deformation, the metal atoms are permanently displaced from their original positions and take up new positions. The ability of some metals to be extensively plastically deformed without fracture is one of the most useful engineering properties of metals. For example, the extensive plastic deformability of steel enables automobile parts such as fenders, hoods and doors to be stamped out mechanically without the metal fracture. And let's talk about engineering stress. Let us consider a cylinder rod of length L0 and cross sectional area A0 subjected to a uniaxial tensile force F. By definition, the engineering stress phi on the bar is equal to the FRS uniaxial tensile force F on the bar divided by the original cross sectional area A0 of the bar. Thus, engineering stress equal F by A0. F means FRS uniaxial tensile force and A0 means original cross sectional area. Now let's talk about engineering strain. When a uniaxial tensile force is applied to a rod, it causes the rod to be elongated in the direction of the force. Such a displacement is called strain. By definition, engineering strain, which is caused by the action of a uniaxial tensile force on a metal sample, is the ratio of the change in length of the sample in the direction of the force divided by the original length of sample considered. Thus, the engineering strain for the metal bar is that is del L by L0. So, engineering strain, strain means change in length of sample by the original length of sample. And there is a sample and here the length is L0 and the cross sectional area is A0 and when Force is applied, tensile force is applied, its length increases and the increment is del L. Now let's talk about Poisson's ratio. A longitudinal elastic deformation of a metal produces an accompanying lateral dimensional change. A tensile stress, phi z, produces an axial strain eta x and eta y. For isotropic behavior, eta x and eta y are equal. And the Poisson ratio is equal to lateral strain by longitudinal strain. The ratio is called Poisson's ratio. For ideal material, Poisson's ratio is 0 0.5. However, for real materials, Poisson's ratio typically ranges 
from 0.25 to 0.54 with an average of about 0.3. Now let's talk about shear stress and shear strain. Another important method by which a metal can be deformed is under the action of a shear stress. The action of a simple shear stress couple on a cubic body where a shearing force S acts over an area A. The shear stress tau is related to the shear force S by the shear stress equal S by A. Here S means shear force and A means area over which shear force acts. Now let's talk about the tensile test and the engineering stress strain diagram. The tensile test is used to evaluate the strength of metal and alloys. In this test, a metal sample is pulled to failure in a relatively short time at a constant rate. And there is a machine for this test and actually in this portion the sample is put and by this two the force is applied and because of this force the metal fails. And this is the diagram of the load and this is specimen and this is a load cell and this is a moving uh, cross set and and this one goes downward and because of this force this specimen fails. The force on the sample being tested is plotted by the instrument on moving chart graph paper while the corresponding strain can be obtained from a signal from an external extensometer attached to the sample and also recorded to the, to the chart paper. The type of samples used for the tensile test vary considerably. For metals with a thick cross section such as plate, a 0.50 inch diameter round specimen is commonly used. For metal with diameter cross section such as sheet, a flat specimen is used. A 2 inch gauge length within the specimen is the most commonly used gauge length for tensile test. The force data obtained from the chart paper for the tensile test can be converted to engineering stress data and a plot of engineering stress versus engineering strain can be constructed. And there is a figure of engineering stress by engineering strain and this is the ultimate result which we get by the tensile test and this point is called the ultimate tensile strength. Now let's talk about mechanical property data obtained from the tensile test and the engineering stress strain diagram. The mechanical properties of metals and alloys that are of engineering importance for structural design and can be obtained from the engineering tensile test are first one modulus of elasticity, second one in strength at 0.2% offset, third one, ultimate tensile strength, fourth one, percent of elongation at fracture, fifth one, percent reduction in area at fracture. Now let's talk about modulus of elasticity. In this first part of the tensile test, the metal is deformed elasticity, that is, if the load on the specimen is released, the specimen will return to its original length. For metals, the maximum elastic deformation is usually less than 0.5%. In general, metals and alloys show a linear relationship between stress and strain in elastic region of the engineering stress strain diagram, which is described by the Hooke's law. The Hooke's law is that is stress by strain, where 
E is the modulus of elasticity or Young's modulus. The modulus of elasticity is related to the bonding strength between the atoms in a metal or alloy. Metals with high elastic moduli are relatively stiff and do not deflect easily. Steels, for example, have high elastic moduli values of 207 gigapascal, where, for example, have high elastic moduli values of 69 to 76 gigapascal. Now, let's talk about yield strength. The yield strength is a very important value for use in engineering structural design since it is the strength at which a metal or alloy shows significant plastic deformation. Because there is no definite point on the stress strain curve where elastic strain ends and plastic strain begins. The yield strength is chosen to be that strength when a definite amount of plastic strain has occurred. For American structural design, the yield strength is chosen when 0.2% plastic strain has taken place. The 0.2% yield strength, also called the 0.2% offset yield strength, is determined from the engineering stress strain diagram. First, a line is drawn parallel to the elastic part of the stress strain plot at 0.002 inch by inch strain. Then at the point where this line intersects the upper part of the stress strain curve, a horizontal line is drawn to the stress axis. The 0.2% offset yield strain is the stress where the horizontal line intersects the stress axis and in the case of the stress strain curve, the yield strength is 78,000 psi. It should be pointed out that the 0.2% offset yield strength is arbitrarily chosen and thus the yield strength could have been chosen at any other small amount of permanent deformation. For example, a 0.1% offset, offset ill strength is commonly used in the United Kingdom. And this is a figure. So, he, uh, vertically there is engine stress and horizontal there is engine strain. And this line is actually 0.2% offset construction line. And these are Relation, a linear relation between stress and strain. Now let's talk about ultimate tensile strength. The ultimate tensile strength is the maximum strength reached in the engineering stress strain curve. If the specimen develops a localized decrease in cross section area, the engineering stress will decrease with further strain until fracture occurs since the engineering stress is determined by using the original cross-sectional area of the specimen. The more ductile a metal is, the more the specimen will neck before fracture and hence the more the decrease in the stress on the stress strain curve beyond the maximum stress. For the high strength aluminum alloy whose stress strain curve there is only a small decrease in stress beyond the maximum stress because this material has relatively low ductility. An important point to understand with respect to engineering stress strain diagram is that the metal or alloy continues to increase in stress up to the stress at fracture. It is only because we use the original cross sectional area to determine engineering stress that the stress on the engineering stress strain diagram decreases at the later part of the test. The ultimate tensile strength of a metal is determined by drawing a horizontal line from the maximum point on the stress strain curve to the stress axis. The stress where this line intersects the stress axis is called the ultimate tensile strength or sometimes 
just the tensile strength. The ultimate tensile strength is not used much in engineering design for ductile alloys since too much plastic deformation takes place before it is raised. However, the ultimate tensile strength can be can give some indication of the presence of defect detects. If the metal contains porosity or inclusions, these defects may cause the ultimate tensile strength of the metal to be lower than normal. And finally, thank you for being with me.